entirely dependent on him and grateful. Ganz auf ihn angewiesen und dankbar. Today is German Thanksgiving Day, a day when, as custom is here in Germany, people remember God's goodness to us, bringing forth the harvest, hopefully a good crop, and give special thanks to Him. These different fruits and vegetables here today on the communion table represent a small gesture of thanks to God for His goodness to us through the harvest. It's been quite a hot and dry year thus far. Still, some people, even in this chilly, rainy days of late, are very thankful for the hot summer, the warm sunshine, and dry climate. So when you leave here this morning, take a good look around outside and notice the weather. Sunshine, clouds, or rain. Inhale the fresher air. See the trees, bushes, plants, flowers, and animals, birds, flying insects still, and don't miss the beautiful leaves changing colors. Ah, what a beautiful sight, isn't it? It's something that I love every year during this time, fall, autumn season. Sometimes I just wish I could collect the big red ones, the leaves that I find nearly every year at a movie theater on my street or in front of a student dormitory building in Fichtenweg in Waldhäuser Ost. What do we learn from the beauty of nature at this time of year when everything seems to be changing? The fall weather and seasonal changes point us to God's provisions and care for us, even during times of transition. Do we realize that God is still in control, although many things around us are changing? We are indeed entirely dependent on Him. But do we give thanks for Him for this? Do we remember Him at all? Some people have been more open to God during, also during the corona pandemic these past two and a half years when things were pretty shaky, things were pretty uncertain and it's unstable. And now when the pandemic seems to be mostly over, though it could come back again, some people are going back to their old normal ways of depending on themselves and forgetting God. I pray that this is not the case for us. Still, it is a very easy temptation for all of us to rely on ourselves, on our own strength and ability, especially when things seem to be going well for us, especially when everything works and we have all that we need. This is exactly the situation in our sermon text today from the Old Testament, from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, that's quite a long word, difficult to pronounce in English. German sounds easier with fifth, the fifth book of Moses. The word Deuteronomy consists of two Greek words meaning second and law. So what does the second law mean? After 40 years of wandering, seeming, seemingly aimlessly through the Sinai Desert of the Sinai Peninsula, the people of Israel once again hear the word of God given to them by their prophet Moses, who led them out of slavery from the land of Egypt by God's mighty hand. Forty days after God had led them out of Egypt and saved the entire people of Israel, seven, uh, several million strong, and overthrown the horsemen and the chariots of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, by drowning them in the Red Sea, God gave the Israelites His law, including the Ten Commandments, to Moses on Mount Horeb in Sinai. But what happened next? You Perhaps you know the story. The Israelites rebelled as Moses remained on the mountaintop with God for 40 days and 40 nights, though they, they, didn't, they didn't think, they thought Moses wasn't even coming back. And so, so they decided to create their own God in their own image, 
according to their own wishes and desires. A God that whether they could make up their own rules for. And so they forced Aaron, the high priest, to mold a golden calf for them to worship. Moses comes down the mountain with the Ten Commandments, written on tablets of stone with the finger of God. He throws the tablets to the ground in anger and begins destroying the the golden calf. God punishes the people of Israel for their disobedience and rebellion ten times throughout the entire 40 years of wandering and does not allow the older generation of people whom He rescued from slavery to enter the land He promised to them. He promised to give them through their forefathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now nearly all the older people, 20 years and older at the time of the exodus from Egypt, have died off. It's now time for change, for entering a new era, a new country with new challenges and new opportunities. It's now time for the younger generation to listen up, hear, and learn God's commandments again a second time. So he, Moses repeats them so that they will be able to be, enter God's promised land, the, the land of Canaan, what is now modern-day Israel and Palestine, to receive God's ch- promised blessings to them. Can they do it? Will they do it? Are they up to the challenge? Will they pass the test? They can only do it with God's help by trusting and having faith in Him alone and not in themselves and their own strength. Now let's take a little closer look at our text this morning, at the opportunities, challenges, and tests, and see what this has to do with ourselves being thankful to God during this period of change in our lives and in the world today. First, the opportunity and the promise. There's free land, free food, Free tuition for studies, free room and board. Wouldn't that be a great opportunity for all students today? That's like giving, getting a full-ride scholarship to study at a major important university. Has anyone ever experienced this? Yes, I have, and I know. It's really a great blessing. But despite all the freebies Life in general isn't always easy, even as a student. If you're new to Tübingen, as I was in the fall of 1987, then again in the fall of uh, 1985, then again in the fall of 1987, you've got some bureaucratic hurdles to jump over, some hoops to jump through every day before you can really concentrate on your studies. It seems like you spend half or more every day for the first several weeks, maybe months, just taking care of business, running errands, waiting in long lines, getting frustrating replies from people sitting behind desks, such as, come back again when, you know, when you've got all your papers, the proper papers, or certain forms filled out and completed. Maybe you don't even know the procedure for going about it and getting things done. It seems like you waste a half a semester of time getting things done. It seems like the bureaucrats, so the bureaucrats intentionally throw roadblocks and hindrances in your way to keep you from getting everything done, to test your patience as a newcomer in Tübingen. But God isn't an unfriendly, insensitive bureaucrat. He promises the Israelites a good land, one that is well watered with brook streams and deep springs gushing out into the valley and into the waste, into the, onto the hills. And it's, what a contrast that is to nearly 40 years of wandering in a barren wasteland, a desert with little water and vegetation. Things grow in the promised land of Canaan. And there is a harvest there of foods they've never tasted before or grown up with wandering around in the desert. There's wheat, barley, grapes, figs, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey. And they'll eat normal bread there and not manna, which they plant and harvest and mill into flour, bake as bread. It will be a land of plenty, not lacking anything. And there will also be mineral resources, iron and copper, for building new technology in daily life. 
What a great opportunity and blessing. Ah, they can already taste it now. They've already got good ideas about what to do with it. Plans for using and taking advantage of this great opportunity and blessing. Can we see ourselves with with this and in this great opportunity, with this great blessing even today? In the next verse, in verse 10 of our text, Moses tells the Israelites, When you have eaten and are satisfied, Praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. What good things have we eaten and consumed and enjoyed and been filled and satisfied with today that we should thank and praise God because He has given it to us and allowed us to have it. James, the half-brother of the Lord, writes in the New Testament, For every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Let's begin with the small things we can be thankful for. Food on the table, clear, clean, running water, a safe, warm place to sleep, study, work, friends, family, good health, fresh air, faith in Jesus Christ, His Son, the, the Bible, God's Word, peace in our countries, and many, many other things in specific situations. Answers to prayers. God has given us many things and opportunities, and He has promised us much more, even more than grapes and figs, pomegranates, and fresh, abundant, fresh, abundant bread. Are we thankful, grateful? To, do we appreciate what God has done for us? That's a real challenge and test for us. With a full-ride scholarship and lots of freebies, it's easy to take things for granted and not to be thankful for them, especially when even something small goes wrong, doesn't work, or becomes a minor problem or inconvenience. An old adage in America is, there is no free lunch. And another is, there's always a catch. That means that with freedoms, with privilege, even with free gifts, there is always some element of responsibility and respect, honor, commitment, or obligation connected to them. How many people today have forgotten this? What things in life have been given to us that we didn't earn, we didn't work for, we didn't uh, we, did, we couldn't have attained without someone else's help, indeed without God's help. Our biggest debt of gratitude goes to God. But can we really thank and appreciate God? When we appreciate something someone has done for us, we'll say thank you to them or write them a special kind note or we'll do something special for them. That person, that person feels appreciated, feels honored, feels valued and respected. But how do we express this to God? Moses tells the younger Israelites who have, in the meantime, taken over many roles of leadership in their families, clans, and tribes, how to do this in verse 11. He says there, Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God failing to observe His commands, His laws, His decrees that I am giving to you this day. Take care that you don't forget God. How can we forget God? By disregarding what He has told us, by ignoring what He has revealed to us about ourselves, about life, uh, by not taking serious and doing the opposite of what He has said is morally right and is morally wrong, by neglecting what He has commanded us to do. My wife Naomi told me twice last week to bring two items with me to the church that we needed to do something very important here together. But what happened? I got busy with other things, things that were important to me, my tasks, my responsibilities, and left the house with no thought of what Naomi had asked me to bring with me. This is the way it is with God and His commands, laws and decrees that He has given us. We get busy with other things and other things that are than just God, what honors Him alone, what He has specifically commanded us and told us 
what is right and what is wrong. We go our own way. We get distracted. Naomi wasn't happy at all when I arrived at the church empty-handed. I'd, uh, I'd brought all my things, but not what she'd asked me to bring with me, and so I had to make an extra trip back home to pick them up again, as they were necessary. In his famous parable of the sower, or the four types of soils, Jesus explains that there are people who, who when they hear God's Word, they get distracted by fears, worries, but also by their own selfish desires for money, or for status, for success, for knowledge, for many other things that they, in the end, don't really hear and put into practice, obey God's Word for their lives. Other things in competition with God's Word. Choke it out and never let God's Word influence, their, their, influence their, and define what they think about and what they plan and do in their lives. They never let it change their daily, everyday life because these other things are bigger than God's Word and God's place in their lives. Moses lists here some of those good things in life that the Israelites will literally take over. They will literally take over when they enter the promised land of Canaan. At the same time, these same good things will distract them, will ensnare them, and will become more important to them than God. In verses 12 through 14, he mentions the good food that they eat there. They will eat there and fill themselves with, with an opulent meals. Then, then the good, sturdy, luxurious houses made of wood and stone that they will work hard for, build, and live in. That's quite a contrast, a big contrast to the daily manna and living in crude tents made of animal skins Schaffe, spare, häusle baue. Work hard, save your money, and build a little house is an old Swavian proverb adage that encourage a good, courage is a good worth ethic, but it doesn't mention anything about God trusting in Him to provide or trusting in Him, honoring Him, being thankful to Him for what He has given and blessed. Diligent, hard work, persistent, saving your money might help you to reach your goals of financial improvement, success, a higher position. But will it really make you happy? Will it really honor God? Do material success and more money not lift up our heart, uh, lift up our hearts to become proud of ourselves rather than God? How quickly is forgotten? who He is, and what He has done for us. In less than 80 days' time, the Israelites had forgotten that God, the powerful voice who had literally spoken to them through thunder from the mountain, had rescued them from slavery, 400 years of slavery in Egypt, and sustained them in the desert with nearly no resources to that day. They poured all of their jewelry, gold jewelry, and all of their effort into something that was not God and was destroyed in a matter of minutes. Can all the things that we put our toil and sweat into be lost in an instant? This is something to think about seriously, seriously think about and to remember what God says here. You may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms His covenant which He swore to your ancestors as it is today. The younger generation of Israelites, some of them nearly 60 years old, still remember when leaving Egypt as children, what, with what they, leaving Egypt as children, they grew up, uh, but, but had lived most of their lives in the vast and dreadful desert, led only by God through, through waterless land with venomous snakes and scorpions, dangers every day, surviving on God's provision for water brought to them out of solid rock. And they ate manna. Food given to them nearly every day by God from heaven. 
which they gathered in the morning from the ground. A miracle, something that had never happened before, never been known to man, something that had never occurred again in all of human history. They know how many times they lost loved ones who died in plagues, God's punishment for their rebellion and disobedience. How humbling were those tests. But now God explains to them the purpose, the reason for all their hardship, and gives them some hope and light at the end of the tunnel, so that in the end it might go well with you. Verse 16, which directions will the Israelites go in the future? Will they have the success that God has promised them? and Can they enjoy it? Their success is certain. Their future is bright here with God's promise. But the test and the challenge will be, will they have faith, trust in God, and remember to thank Him by doing what He says and by being what He has called them to be? Or will they forget Him, pat themselves on the back and do their own thing, live their lives only pleasing themselves? Bill Gates and all the wealthy people or all around the world could not accomplish one thing in this life if God had not blessed them with the things that He's blessed them with. Many people gripe and complain about how bad things are, but have they forgotten all the good God has already given them? Many other people think that there are more no moral consequences for the things they do and for the decisions that they make about their lives and about God today. God doesn't care, they think, uh, it doesn't make any difference in the future or after I'm dead and gone what I did in my life. But our sermon text today ends with a stern warning for people who think this way. Forgetting God, following other things in life, gods such as work or study or a bicycle or car, vacation, success, status, honor, or reputation, even family. Other, anything other than and more than Him will lead us down a path to destruction at the latest in eternity, separation from God, eternal anger and regret about rejecting Him. And if the Israelites back then hear these words of warning from that old prophet Moses and don't believe him, they know they will see it for themselves, the destruction of the nations in the promised land of Canaan. Not by their own strength and military power, but because of God's judgment upon those nations. These are serious words for them. Serious words for us also today. Being thankful to God today isn't trying to be nice to God so He doesn't punish you, or trying to have a positive outlook on life, but it is a part of a living, real love relationship with an eternal God who is serious about what He gives us, His mercy, many good gifts every day, and about our future with Him that He has promised in a place that He has promised. This place isn't just the land of Canaan, destroyed and reoccupied many times over millennia, but a place more beautiful and permanent, with no war or conflicts, no hunger, no sadness, no mourning or death, but unfathomable beauty, awesome majesty, because we are with the Lord in all of His glory. This promise, Jesus gives us through His life, through His death for us on the cross, His burial, His resurrection from the dead, and His promised return to earth one day to receive us. He promises us in John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life, He says. The one who believes in Me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in Me will never die. Until that day, we should therefore live our lives to remember and please Him. It begins with this attitude in our hearts. We are always dependent on Him, not on ourselves. Dependent on what He gives us, His promise to us. Let us therefore open our hearts to listen 
to and to follow His words. Finally, let us also learn to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, as the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. I'm going to give you a negative example here. A Christian man was traveling through the mountains of Tennessee, driving through on his car, in his car, and he had a flat tire. Naturally, he thought, Lord, why did you allow me to have a flat tire here? He was a spiritual man, but he maintained his composure and replaced the flat tire. Uh, didn't get too angry about it, as I would have. But after a, a thir about 30 minutes, he got in his car, drove down the road, and discovered a large rock slide. Several cars had been covered, and several of them had been uh, even knocked off the side of the mountain. All of this took place about the same time he had the flat tire. While he did not thank the Lord for the flat tire, he realized that if he had not had that flat tire, he could have been one of those who got seriously hurt or even been killed. And he then was thankful for the bad that came into his life because it could have been much worse. Another expression of thanks is, a, a magazine polled some very famous people, very rich people all around the world. They were asked this question. If you were, could be granted one wish that could come true right now, what would that be? Many of those people who were asked, rich, famous people, uh, said, I wish I could be given an even, gra even greater ability to appreciate all that I really have. Let us remember to give thanks to God today and each day for what He has already given us and for His promise to give us a far better promised land in which we will gather, we will together be made perfect. Amen.